What is the problem with in one ear and out the other kind of hearing? If someone listens in a way that it goes in one ear and out the other, what's the problem with that? You're not really listening, you're mm -hmm. hearing. You're not adjusting what you actually heard. Yeah. And why, why is that a bad thing to, to do yeah, that? It's, it's like you don't remember anything mm -hmm. and you're just thinking that you heard something and you don't know what the person is saying. Yeah. I think you, you hear something, you don't actually know what to say. It doesn't really influence your worldview, right? It does not make it more precise, more complete, more consistent. Right? It does not maybe alter some things in your worldview, like the picture of the world, how it works. Right? So it's just like a waste of time. Yeah, because it, it's a waste of time for you as well, because it doesn't actually affect you in any way. You're just hearing noises, but not learning anything. Mm -hmm. No, not count as truth, but that's a good point. Like you maybe you won't actually believe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't even necessarily even consider it as being whether it's true or not. It just it's in, it's insignificant. Yeah. Hey, Jackie. But it goes in one ear and out the other, like literally. I mean, it could be like just going through, right through. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't go through the brain to assess, analyze, determine, mm -hmm. you know, the content. And it doesn't go into the heart mm -hmm. deep to reflect internally mm -hmm. to, in the heart, how, how does this, is it true? to reflect, and then how, if so, then how can I change my behavior yeah. to, and sometimes hearing things can be very painful, but it is good to hear so that we can ask God to help us to um, maybe take different steps, different actions, different behaviors. Yeah. So it, it goes into our hearts and then has to come out through our actions and our mouth and what we do and say and think. And it won't do that if we just... And I guess there's, I guess there's better... There are worse things. I guess it's better than not putting something into your brain or like putting junk in. But you go, well, what's the point if you're not actually stopping and listening and thinking? I'm sorry, Inez, were you going to say something else? No, I'm sorry. Oh, that's Okay. So perhaps infamously, maybe famously, this, this is the story of Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, obviously a very intelligent man, very thoughtful, but uh, in the spring of 1740, George Whitfield, it's the other guy saying there, famous British preacher, evangelist, um, one of the men credited with kicking off the first great awakening in America went from place to place, and he was preaching in Philadelphia to thousands of people outdoor, which is amazing if you think about it, because uh, I don't know if many of you have tried speaking outdoors and preaching outdoors. I have done that. Um, it's really hard. There's a lot of noise. It, it, it exhausts your lungs, and he did this day after day after day. Benjamin Franklin attended a lot of these messages, and Franklin was amazed. He, he always said he didn't believe a word of it, but Whitfield believed it. Quote, I'll quote him, he, says his, he said, his delivery was so improved by frequent repetition, every accent, every emphasis, every modulation of his voice was so perfectly well-turned and well-placed that without being interested in the subject, one could not help being pleased with the discourse a pleasure of much the same kind that was received from an excellent piece of music. <coughs> Hear that? So what is, what did he like about Whitfield's sermons? What was he impressed by? Well, the form. What? The form. <coughs> the form? What about the form? Well, he was impressed how well, perfect was the form, the delivery, right? The pitch, uh, <coughs> the 
say that <coughs> didn't say much about the meaning, yeah. about the sense. The speech became flawless, very clearly uh, spoken. <coughs> the words were clearly emphasized. And uh, he was an excellent orator mm -hmm. and speaker. That's what. So the um, quote is kind of cut off. Oh, yeah. That's what uh, was good on him. As far as the getting out of the serving. Mm -hmm. And why why could he like <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. this is you're coming up recently. Can I get you some water? I have water, thank you. Um, so why could he like what how he said it without believing what he said? Why could he like what, how Whitfield said it without believing what Whitfield said? Well, he used, in that paragraph, he used the word modulation, which is a musical term for modulation, making loud, soft, changing keys, and giving variety to what he was saying. It causes you to wonder to see because then you're trying to figure out what he's trying to say with the way he stood with modulation, accent, emphasis. He made it, he made it to where you wanted to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like art, you know, it's like <coughs> art, uh, you know, a painting of Claude Monet or, you know, Rembrandt, like a, just a you know, beautiful piece of art, but in like, you know, talking. Even though it's not something you agree with, you can admire someone's ability to, you know, articulate. Mm -hmm. There you go. Benjamin Franklin was a politician, mm -hmm. and he wanted to imitate the way this person delivers his ovation. And though Franklin didn't do everything, but he was impressed. And he wishes she could do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a politician. So here we are in the scene of a famous sermon by Jesus. And there are great crowds following him. What do you think some, li some listeners were interested in hearing Jesus the same way that Franklin was interested in hearing um, Whitfield? Do you think any of them came with uh, wrong attitudes, and, and what could those have been? That might be fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. FOMO is a powerful, powerful uh, one. Fear of missing out, FOMO, yeah. And Jackie. Or, what can this man do for me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't expect me to believe that, do you? Mm-hmm. They're, they're being critical of it, yeah. Now, Jesus finishes off his sermon not allowing any of that. He finishes off his sermon in verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Like, you got to do what I say, he says. Like, this is, this, is, this is serious. So just remembering this, this is the, in the Greek... Verse 46 starts off with and, or <coughs> we'll see how this goes. Um, or perhaps it could be translated and so, because of everything that was said, so. This is the conclusion of the sermon. Jesus is bringing it to an end. Uh, the sermon known as the Sermon on the Plains, verse 20 through 26, is the blessings and woes showing the wisdom of the disciples' choices that need to follow him. Verse 27 through 36 calls for being merciful, like God loves his enemies. Verse 39 through 45 is the need for Jesus' disciples to judge properly, according to his method. 
Here get to verse 46, we get to the, so what? Listen and obey. And 47 through 49, he gives this closing image of saying, what's going to happen if you listen to me or not? Now, it seems like opposite day in Jesus' world. If you follow the, the flow of his argument, he starts off basically saying, those who seem to have everything right now are actually missing the most important thing. That's the, that's the woes and the blessings. And those who have nothing can be satisfied in Christ. It is love those who hate you, judge with God's standard, not your own. And the heart of the issue is your heart is in the wrong place. You can't just change the outward fruit. You have to change the heart behind it. And he ends with a very scary condemnation. He says at the end of verse 49, those who do not listen, the ruin of that house was great. It's not a very winsome way to end a sermon. Right? Jesus is not, not winning friends here. He's like, oh yeah, and, and you know, just, just give me a try. Give me, give me a 30-day trial and see if your life is better. No, he's basically, if you don't listen to me, your life is ruined. Sorry. Um, but that's the whole point. Jesus gives the bad news of why they have to listen before he gives the good news of what it means to follow him and see his life, death, and resurrection. So today, we're going to try to, if my voice holds up, it's very random, uh, why truly listening to Jesus is the only right choice. Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Plain saying why truly listening to Jesus is the only right choice. Uh, can someone read verses 46 to 49 for me? Jared, you got it? Luke 6, 46 through 49. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house, and dug deep and laid the foundation of the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house, and it could not be shaken, because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And the stream broke against it immediately and fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So, verse 46 is his point. Not everyone who calls Jesus Lord actually follows. There are a bunch of people who are interested in what Jesus says, but not everyone who calls him Lord follows him. Now, this is, this is the kick of the sermon, is why do you say these things without action? Why do you give lip service to following me? Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word that they speak. Like, Jesus, God, cares about the words that we say and the terms that we use. Every careless word will be brought into judgment, let alone important words. He says they're calling him Lord. It's an important title. What does Lord mean? Master. Master. What else? King. King. Ruler. Ruler. Owner. In the Greek word kurios, so you can see in this area, it's kurios, Lord. Kurios translates often from the Old Testament the divine type name Yahweh. So often when he says Jesus is Lord, there's this connection, especially when it's quoting from Old Testament, this is Yahweh here. And it's to acknowledge he reigns. He is king over all. If you recall, you don't have to turn there, but in chapter 1, verse 43, Elizabeth had Mary come to visit her. And she says, Oh, how blessed I am that the mother of my Lord has come to visit Right? She recognizes he's Lord. Zechariah predicts in verse 76 that John will prepare the way for the Lord, Jesus' way. So there's always pictures like the, Luke is leading up, Jesus is Lord. Jesus claims he is Lord. And the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 10 makes clear that Jesus being Lord is required for salvation. 
Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the heart one believes and is justified and the mouth one confesses and is saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10. So there is no following Jesus and being saved by Jesus without saying he is Lord. But it's interesting. Look down your Bibles. He doesn't just say Lord once, does he? He says what? Lord, Lord. It's usually a very intimate term, often referred as like asking for something. So in Matthew 7, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So they're, they're, they're entering into heaven. And they're like, Lord, Lord, let me in. Or the virgins in his parable in Matthew 25 come saying to, him, to the closed doors, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. So this is a, this is a requesting phrase, not just like, hey, Lord. It's like, Lord, Lord, please. Now, what's Jesus doing right now? Often, especially when um, before he teaches and after he teaches, what kind of amazing things is Jesus doing? Healing. Healings. Yeah. Miracles of various kinds. What could people be asking for then when they when they say, Lord, Lord? Oh, thank you. Hmm? Help us one way or another. So Jesus is saying, you come to me saying, Lord, Lord, heal me. Do this thing for me. Help me. Give me guidance. And he says, but do you do what I say? Do you obey my word? Again, very, very on the nose way of saying that, isn't it? How often like, would you think someone comes to you and they're asking for help and you look at them and you go, yes, but are you doing what's already been given to you? And, and this is exactly what Paul warns to Titus of the false teachers. In Titus 1.15, he says, They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. James Titus 1.16. There's people who profess, but they deny by their actual actions. It's faith without works, justification without sanctification, and salvation without a changed life. You know who else says the exact same thing? James, the brother of Jesus. Right? James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, be filled, without giving them the food, the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So Jesus is rebuking. James is pointing out. Paul is recognizing a type of faith without any fruit that submits to Jesus. Remember Jesus had just talked beforehand, you will know a tree by its fruits. What comes out shows what's in the roots. And now he's saying, ah, but your words mean nothing unless your fruit is actually good. Perhaps think of James this way. We all have signs of, of life, right? A person moves, if, if they are in a bed and they're asleep, you know, how many times, I know I do this, like when my kids, sometimes my kids are really sleepy long, especially when they were little babies, and I would go and I'd put my ear near their head and listen for breathing. Or I'd put my hand on their chest and see if it rises and falls because, you know, maybe I'm the only one, but as a parent, you're like, oh no, my child isn't moving at all. Have they died in the middle of the night? Like, this is just have these moments of fear. Or you think of a family member in a hospital who's very sick and, they, and they've stopped making any noise and you go check for their pulse, right? These this are signs of life. 
Can you think, what are other signs of life compared to a corpse? What, what's the difference? What, what are movements that someone makes compared to what a corpse does? Reactions. Reactions, yeah. If you poke, if you poke someone, even if they're sleeping or barely alive, they'll move, right? What else? The heat from the, from the body. Yeah, the body produces a set of heat. Dead people cool off very quickly. The color. The color, yeah. There's evidence. There's evidence. What was that? What is, what is the, breath, yes, yes. And so what the Bible reminds us of is that someone can say they trust Jesus, that, G, that they're a Christian, all they want, but if they are not actually trusting the commands that Jesus gives by doing them, then they're not really trusting him. They're not really his followers. They're not Christians, and therefore they are not saved. Is anyone familiar with the lordship controversy? Yeah. Ever heard that? Inez knows anyone else? Anyone else heard that phrase, lordship controversy? No. Got a couple of no's, a couple of yeses. So during it was a much larger than these two, but a lot of it went around a conflict in the 1980s, a, a debate, not like a fight, but a debate um, between people like Zane Hodges and John MacArthur. Zane Hodges wrote a book called The Gospel Under Siege, where he argued that people were adding works to salvation by claiming repentance and submission to the lordship of Christ was necessary for salvation. Hodge, Hodge said salvation was by faith alone, and faith does not include repentance, obedience, or submission to Jesus' lordship. Um, he argued that the good works um, are not necessary for salvation, that you could, you could be a carnal Christian, uh, that he would point to passages like in Romans, uh, sorry, Romans, Revelation um, 1 through 3, and he says, well, look, at you have some carnal churches here. These churches are churches, and yet they are not acting really well, and Jesus is threatening them. Um, and uh, Charles Ryrie similarly said that the term Lord just means you see him as God, but not necessarily he's the boss. Um, it, well, what would you say? What would you say? Okay, I'll, I would just say repentance is a gift. Mm-hmm. So what is your point? Yeah. Not today, no, no. They today. Oh, yeah, people are still the teaching. The book that John MacArthur wrote was the gospel according to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we were at a convention of IFCA, and one third of all the members of IFCA that were biblical left because Dallas at that point said he could accept Jesus as Savior without accepting him. Mm -hmm. well, that's not going to fly if you believe the word Lord mm -hmm. Jesus and Jesus says in John 14 2 if you love me you will keep my commandments obey my commandments you know I, I, it's, if you want to go back you should go back and listen to Pastor Yuri's messages on Revelation 1 through 3 I'm talking about those, those seven churches. Because you know, Zane Hodges pointed them out. But those churches were in really bad spots. And some of them we, we, we were unbelievers in the middle of the church. There, there were some believers, but there were some that were unbelievers. And um, Jesus was warning them. Here, he clearly even says, you cannot call me Lord and not do what I tell you. Jesus expects that. But then here's the reason for that debate. Because we all get this. You're like, but none of us are perfect, right? None of us obey Jesus' commands all the time. So you ask then, why? Like, why should we try and follow Christ if we're never going to be perfect with it? And part of the answer the Bible gives repeatedly is the more we follow Christ, the more we will be assured of our own salvation. 
this is a helpful chart in a book about easy believism. Um, you'll see on the, let me see if I can, oops, there we go. Let me draw on this here. Over here on the far left side, you have non-Christians who have a clear, strong evidence of non-belief. These people deny Jesus completely. And so we're pretty sure, hey, if you deny Christ, you are not a Christian. Now, you have on the other side people who have strong evidence of faith. They not only, they don't, they don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk. Right? And you're like, wow, this, like, if, if you see evidence in your own life, and you'll say, I am believing and I am trusting, you're like, I, I know God is working in me. But we have this area in between, too. Right? Which, which is sometimes where we're at, where there's mixed evidence of unbelief and faith whether you're like oh man like i there's some bad things and some good things happening and that should make us kind of go well i i don't know if i can have assurance there's going to be questions that rise up in your mind if there's you know some evidence then assurance is weaker but you're still able to grow and this gives us an opportunity then to address and say i want to move over this way. I want to grow my faith. I want to obey more. To let me know, I really do believe this. Bishop J.C. Ryle wisely stated, obedience is the only sound evidence of saving faith. The talk of the lips is worse than, worse than useless if it is not accompanied by sanctification of the life. I like, I like, we, we need, let, let, Again, your walk, back up your talk. Let me have you guys ponder this then. Say you're in that crowd. You're one of Jesus' followers. He's, he says this to you. You know, he's talking to a whole crowd, but you're part of this group too. Why is it loving and helpful for Jesus to make us question, even if we're believers, like, I already gave my life to you, Jesus. I'm following you. And he's like, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Why is that a loving thing to ask? Because I'm sure all of us could be like, yep, I'm, I'm not doing what he's telling me in area. Why is it a loving thing for him to challenge us in that regard? Because humbles, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes a challenge that says that keeps us humble and keeps us progressing it keeps us oh that's a great point yeah yeah Inez Jesus, um, Paul asked I mean Jesus asked the disciples to tell him You think of some of the, the best athletes in any field. Michael Jordan, obviously one of the greatest, and who said that he had often would like, he would love to play um, interviews and commentary of people questioning him and, and, and asking if he still was the greatest to motivate him to keep going. He's like, no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to push. I'm going to make sure of this. Or think of it also like a test, right? What are the point of tests? Hopefully not to make you look stupid, but actually to show what you do know. Right? That, that is the point of a good test. Bad tests just want to make you fool of you. Good tests, you take them to prove to yourself, even at times, I actually know what I'm doing and I can handle the situations, right? It's a good question to ask. And, and I know 
people sometimes get so easily offended if they are, if they are ever said, are you really a believer? And yet, repeatedly, Scripture tells us, test yourselves. Ask yourself if you're a believer. Now, that's different. I'm not saying we shouldn't necessarily go around to every person who's like, oh, well, you did something wrong. Are you really a believer? Like, no, even Paul, when he says that, he says, I am sure that Christ is in you. He wants it to be encouraging. But we shouldn't be just so easily offended. It actually can be a good opportunity for us to go, okay, yeah, let me, let me assess. But Jesus also says this because, second part, the, the parable part, not all who appear good actually are. Not all who appeal, appear like they are in a good place, that they're doing well, actually are. Can someone read verses 47 through 49 one more time? Luke 6, 47 through 49. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and hid a foundation upon the rock and laid the foundation upon the rock. And when a flood rose, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. Is that it? Um, keep going. Okay. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built his house, built a house upon the ground without any foundation, and the torrent burst against it, and immediately it collapsed, and the ruin of that house was great. So notice there's this buildup that Jesus starts with. He's everyone who comes, hears my word, and does them. If you recall, we've talked about how right now there's a large crowd. This is a crowd, a religious crowd outside of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. So it's not it's the same place. Jesus is in Galilee, not here. But it's just a large crowd like this one gathering for religious purposes. And Jesus is giving an image to prove he doesn't just want religious people doing religious activities. He wants more than that. He wants obedient people. He wants changed people. And he starts it off by talking about the nice looking building that we all have. Or buildings, plural, I guess you could say. Um, buildings in Israel were at those time often influenced by Greek designs. Um, there were about 30 major cities built in, in Israel. Uh, by the Romans. Um, we, most of them built with bricks and such, stones such as these. Galilee was called the Galilee of the Gentiles after all. So it was very influenced by Greek culture. You can even see it's just remnants of that. Um, they were planned cities, arches, theaters, public baths. Jewish homes were usually small flat roofs over facing a courtyard. So give a, a simple image. And you know, they would have to build in different places wherever the land was available. And so Jesus gives the image of two homes, right? On the surface, house one and house two. What's the difference between them? No difference. Why not? Mm -hmm. What's the slight difference? That's true. That's true. I, I was wondering if anyone would point that out. So I, I got this from, from a, um, uh, Dr. Street from the, up of the Master Seminary. He, he made these images, or maybe he got them from someone else. But so I was looking at that too, going, I'm like, yeah, there's, there's some slight bushes difference. Maybe, maybe that was on purpose. <laughs> but... They're the same on the outside. Yeah. Top layer looks the same. And if we were to apply this to today, perhaps we'd say, you know, people can look pretty good. They go to church. 
They read their Bibles. They listen to sermons. They have a fairly, you know, normal, conservative lifestyle. Um, they are going to look the same, whether they are faithful, obedient Christians or not. They are going to look pretty much the same on the outside, on the top layer. But underneath them, there is a good foundation or a bad foundation. That's the picture Jesus is painting. They're, they look the same on the top, but underneath there's a good foundation and a bad foundation. Now, again, look down your Bibles, verse 48. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. Uh, here you can see a picture of rock cuttings on the summit of Jabesh Gilead where the rocks would have been dug out from the ground, cut to be able to build something on top of. And, and there's this joke that Israelis make that when God created the world, he gave an angel a large sack full of rocks. And he told him to go and scatter the rocks all over the world. So the angel flies across the world and drops rocks all over. And then he ended up over Israel and the bag broke and all the rocks. Because if you go, if you go to Israel and you dig into the ground, this is not easy digging. This is hard digging because every few like inches, there's a rock. And what do you have to do if you find a rock, Jared? You got to pull it out. I, I should have gone. When I had, I went to an archaeological dig and we're like looking for like little types, pieces of pottery and things like that. But every few steps, you find a giant boulder and you have to pull these boulders out of the ground and get them out of the way. So digging in Jesus' day was not a simple effort. No power tools, lots of rocks to move. So here is given this idea this person digs down. They push hard work in. There is sweat and tears and scrapes and blood to get to a foundation. Again, now let's go a little bit deeper. All right? So the house number one is a strong foundation. He dug deep. This is the man who puts hard labor into putting his truth into practice into his life based on the solid rock of the words of Jesus. House two doesn't have that. It's just, it's just on the surface, just laid out there quickly and easily. Probably house two, worker two, you say um, that the second one, he's like a man who, um, no, but the one who hears and does not do them, verse 49, is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. It's a lot easier, a lot faster. Looks the same. But then something happens. The flood comes and it reveals. It reveals the truth. Now, a consistent problem in Israel was flash flooding. Floods, he says, are going to rise up and the water is going to burst upon the house. Now, I, I wish I, I tried to get them into my presentation. I couldn't get them to work, but I actually have some pictures of the Mississippi Delta overflowing of water and people building literal islands around their home with sandbags and dirt. And it's so it's crazy because you see water. It looks like a lake all around and that there's this circle of land protecting these people's houses because they knew it was coming. They're like, oh, the floods are coming. Let's prepare. That wasn't so easy in Jesus' day. Throughout Israel, there are these dry valley beds called wadis. Um, you can kind of see it there. See how it, there's like this area right here and this line. And you'd, you'd go to a spot like this and it would be dry for months or years. And you could see, easily see someone could just come here and like, okay, I'm just gonna build my house right up next to this thing. Or one of the greatest dangers is people are just hiking in these. Because it's a, when you're going through hills, it's a little easier. There's a little valley. It's soft. But what made this crevice? Water. water. And water that comes through quickly. So one of the dangers happen, would happen in Israel is you'd be in this wadi, in kind of the lower areas, 
and 30 miles away from you, I don't know that much, maybe, maybe 10, there's a big storm up in the mountains. The water rains and it falls, and you know what the water does? It starts flowing down through the riverbed that the wadi has created, and you're just sitting there, and you know anything, and suddenly water comes rushing in, and a flood happens. This was typical in Jesus' day, even, even still today, as the water would, would flood in. And so Jesus is making the point. Those houses are going to look the same. They're going to be equally built. They're going to look wonderful. But then the storm is going to come, the storms of life, and it's going to reveal the difference. One house will stand and one will fall. He says, when the flood rose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. The other man, when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of the house was great. Proverbs 10.25 says, when the storm has swept away, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. Proverbs 10.25. Again, Jesus' point is he's saying those who hear him and act are the solid ones. Those who hear him and they go, ah, oh, very interesting, Jesus. Excellent point. And maybe they go, you know, I got some time. I, I have some thing, other things to do. Or, you know, I got I to gotta consider more views on this. Jesus says those people are only setting themselves up for trouble. It's only a matter of times before the storms of life bring hardships and things will tumble down. It, look down in verse 49. At the end of it, it says, When the stream broke against it, how quickly did it fall? How quickly? Immediately. In that moment, it collapsed completely. And the ruin was great. This, this is a ruined city, uh, sorry, ruined city, ruined house in Israel. Not that ruined, it's still standing there. But it is, is a greater image of just destruction. Uh, famously, C.S. Lewis said that pain is God's megaphone calling his children back to himself. I think Jesus would say also pain is the megaphone that shocks some people and they fall on their face. Suffering is supposed to be planned by God to bring us back to ourselves, uh, back to him, trusting him, that he has a good plan. Like the storms hit us and it shows our foundation is secure. Other people, it shows it's not. So to go back to what Jesus said in Verse 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. So what happens in the storm of life, the problems, it shows what we treasure. And so what we have to do is treasure God's word. Again, Jesus' brother James, James 1.22, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word but not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he's like. It's worse to hear and not do. I think and that's what's different about Jesus versus just if you watch like a TED talk online or you go and listen to a guru or you read a self-help book, they're just like, hey, here's what I think you should do. Take it or leave it. It's between you. It's a free country after all. Do what you want to do. Jesus doesn't allow that, does he? Jesus says, you must listen to me or the result will be disastrous for you. Now, does that mean we will be perfect? No. Does that mean when the storm comes, the house doesn't get wrecked a little bit? No, it just means it's, it's secure. It won't crumble. But again, look at 
Jesus' word there, he says, um, he's like a man who dug deep. We, we can't be perfect, can we? But we, we, the question is not that. The question is, do we put the hard work in and dig into it? Do we strive? And Andrew Nassali, in his book about sanctification, calling No Quick Fix. No Quick Fix. He's making an argument that sometimes we, we want things to just change right away. And he's like, no, 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 no. Jesus says, you have to dig. You have to work. You have to push through that dirt. And he has this really helpful chart in there where he says repeatedly, if you look at the commands of the Bible, they are telling us to become what God has already made us to be. Very interesting. He says, Romans 6, 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might belong to nothing, but be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You have been crucified. Verse 11, so consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. That you are dead to sin, so consider yourself so. You were once slaves of sin, having been set free from sin, and you've become slaves of righteousness. So present yourself as a slave to righteousness. You are a slave to righteousness. Go be a slave to righteousness. Interesting, isn't it? Um, in, in 1 Corinthians 5, a little bit lower, he says, You are unleavened bread, so clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Well, he's already said you're a new lump. Or Galatians 3. You were baptized into Christ and you have put on Christ. Romans 13. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You get this? This is the beauty of it. Like, where it's like, you are, so work all the more to be. How... How does knowing this commands help us push on, even though we know God's done the work? Like, God's going to do what he's going to do, right? But why should that motivate us to actually push the hard work of trying to do what Jesus says? Does that make sense? Why does that motivate us? If, God, if God's going to do what he's going to do, why are we still motivated to do what he says. Because we believe it. And, and why, that's such a good point. Because why, why should we, why does it help believing it help us to do these things? Mm -hmm. We trust him. He says believe and you shall be saved. Mm -hmm. Well, if we believe him, that's what he does. Yeah. Okay. What? That's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, Jackie. Mm -hmm. That he saved me from the pit of hell and from the darkness and has transferred me to his glorious light. So out of gratitude to be grateful that he took the wrath of God in my place. And so out of gratitude to love him, follow him, follow his footsteps mm -hmm. for what he has done. Yeah. I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, out of gratefulness. I think, um, Tom, so. No, go for it, Sylvia. Um, how I see it is like a God said, uh, Jesus said, when you call me Lord, you don't do what I said. Because He knows the human being's heart, He knows if we are dust, we are weak. We are, you know, we are not that power, except if we follow him in, in, in truth. So, as uh, he knows our condition, he knew that one. That's what also Paul said, examining himself. 
you know, evaluate yourself. Because even Paul, you know, was the last apostle, he had his own struggle. The big men is in the Bible. So we start going the glory to glory to be better, to try to reach the level of God we expect in us. Mm. But it's, 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 some people think it being Christian is easy, but honestly, I don't think so. <laughs> it's, mm. also, it's absolutely all opposite. Especially when it's, uh, you know your limitations, you, you have to recognize what is your weakness and mm. fight for. So that's what the, Jesus said. Do what I said. It's not easy. But so it's not easy for us, like human beings. Remember, Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. So he knew us because he was in the flesh for us. Yeah. And he knew our limitations. That's what I, I mm. the way what I see it. I was in the I would like to hear another yeah. opinion. It's it's helpful because yeah, like what you're doing there, so you're like, well, like what did Jesus do? And that that's the same thing that the the writer of Hebrews does in Hebrews chapter twelve says, oh, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which clings to us so closely. Like let's get those rid of those and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Like, we're supposed to follow Jesus' example. And Jesus' example is he, there was a joy set before him, and he pursued it with all his might. But he still would have had to run that race with endurance. I, I, an idea popped in my head, and you guys said, like, could you imagine if you were... In the, in the U.S. British Allied Force Army on D-Day. And, and you know, so somehow, you got a time machine, and you know the Allied Forces are going to win the, win the war. Right? You, knew, you know that's going to happen. You know it's going to happen. And you're like, okay, we're going to win this battle, and I, I'm entering in this. Would that make the fighting any easier to know that you're going to have a victory at the end? Jared shakes his head, why not? Yeah, so maybe you... So, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a, a dichotomy, I think, mm -hmm. there. It's yeah. Like if, you, if, you, if you knew those soldiers knew that they were going to win, maybe that would. But then, what about the soldiers that, you know, went right onto the beach, mm -hmm. you know, and were going to die by machine gun fire? You know, like, I couldn't imagine, like, it, I don't know, it would be more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would still start with that. Yeah. I'm not going to war. I, my husband was a Marine. He went to Vietnam twice. I never experienced what he did. But I experienced spiritually when I need encouragement to stay on track. I read Hebrews 12. Mm. Because we are. There is a crowd of witnesses, and we need to lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily. He says, and let us run with patience, the race is set before us. It encourages me because I have to keep focus and because I'm still a sinner. Mm -hmm. So that keeps me on track. I don't want to get out of my track and be disqualified. I take it like a track and field. Mm. I'm in a track, and I have to stay on the track. But if I get off, I've got to get back on mm. as quickly as I can. And sometimes, well, it's gotten better as I got older in the Lord and growing in grace. I have been able to do fast recovery with him. But sometimes it takes more time. Because it kind of slides in when you least expect it. And you get off track. Mm. 
could be a word, it could be an action, it could be a desire, it could be a thought, it could be, we're so sinful. <laughs> but that verse, I love mm. Hebrews. Mm. Because he didn't, Jesus mm. never got off the track. He stuck it out. And he marched for the joy. I think there's, there's a good thing, like, you know, perhaps, you know, Jay, I think you're making a good point there. Like, wait, well, if I, I mean, you still be hard. Don't be like, like, yeah. Yes. But I, and I, I would, the answer is, yeah. yes, but it's like, it's still really hard. It's still really hard. I already, you might go, you might go, well, you know, if I'm going to die, I know I'm not dying for nothing. Because like, I, I, I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to win. We're going to succeed. Like if you, if you were being like, you know, persecuted for your faith. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. Like you were in that. You can't, you know, just can't manage it. Yes, mm. you know, you would, you would plead for the other people, you know, to no. believe. That would be your last cry. Like, it's a tough one for me. So many yeah. miracles, too. For a man, when he's struggling, as goes to prison, when she's struggling, Praise God for that. And I think, and what Jesus is trying to get for all of us is this question. Will you fight? Will you strive to do what I say? To believe what I say? Again, it's, it's, the, it's the old image. I, I love the, the idea that, um, I, I think it was R.C. Sproul described faith a very simple way, where he, he said, he said, you know, you describe faith, faith is trust, and it's trusting in the chair. And I could look at this chair and be like, oh, yes, it um, looks like a very secure chair, and I, and I could test the chair, and I could, I could say the chair is made of solid materials, and I could kick the ground around the chair to look at it and be like, this chair, but what's going to prove I actually trust this chair? Sit, Sit in it, right? That is the only thing. I know this chair will work. And that is what faith ultimately is. It's saying, I trust what Jesus says, and so I will do what he says, and I will follow him. I, I was reading from the, I, let me just finish up with this, because I know you guys, it's, it's 805. The Valley of Vision, which is a record of Puritan um, hymns and prayers. I was reading it this morning, and I, and I was really moved and thought about this, where it says, no sin is greater than the sin of unbelief. For if union with Christ is the greatest good, unbelief is the greatest sin as being crossed to thy command. I see that whatever my sin is, yet no sin is like disunion from Christ by unbelief. Lord, keep me from committing the greatest sin and departing from him. For I can never in this life perfectly obey and cleave to Christ. When thou takest away my outward blessings... It is for sin, in not acknowledging that all I have is of thee, in not serving thee through what I have, in making myself secure and hardened. Lawful blessings are secret idols and do most hurt. The greatest injury is in the having, the greatest good in the taking away. In love, divest, divest me of blessings that I may glorify thee the more. That's a very hard thing to say. Lord, lawful blessings are my secret idols, the blessings you give me. But it's saying, Lord, let, let the waters come. Let the flood take place so that I could believe in you more. That, that's what he's calling for. And I think that's why we should not be afraid. I should not be afraid. I'm preaching to myself here of the floods of life because they reveal what we truly believe in and God uses them to grow us, to make our fruit better or to show us where our faith really needs to be 
in the one foundation that lasts, Jesus Christ.